Two of the largest and most important books of the Old Testament are the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. They, along with Genesis and Exodus, may be sort of, if you wanted to find the backbone of the story uh, of Israel, of the Old Testament, this, those would be the four books I'd probably choose. But the thing about uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah, along with the rest of their prophetic brethren, Amos, Hosea, Micah, the rest of the prophets, is that we only really read them at two times of year. We tend to trot them out during the weeks before Christmas when we hear Jeremiah say, it's Jeremiah 33, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made. In those days I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And so we read about this in the latter half of Jeremiah. This Latin, we read about this good news of this, uh, this new king who's coming, and then Christmas, yippee, new king is born. And in the same way with Lent, we read out of the latter half of Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 31. The days are surely coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And so we tend to get the prophets out and look at them during the run-up to Easter, the run-up to Christmas. And what we tend to do is look at the latter half of them. We tend to look at Isaiah, Isaiah 64 I believe chapters long. We tend to look at Isaiah 40 and following. Jeremiah is like 54 chapters long. We'll look at Jeremiah 31, 33, the latter half of the book. But we never look at the first half of the book. I, I, I have to confess, I looked at this. I have never preached on the first half of any book of the prophets. I have never heard a sermon on the first half of any books of the prophets. I have never heard anyone stand up and talk about What's the problem that led to the need for the New Covenant? We always say, New Covenant, yippee! New King of David, yippee! We never read the first half of the book that points out why did you need a new king? Why did you need a new covenant? I realized that as I started reading Jeremiah, uh, the beginning of Jeremiah th this week, as we're going to look at Jeremiah th this entire month, and, and I, just, yeah, I was struck by that. We have never talked about this. So we're going to. We're going to look at this today and uh, throughout the month. And we'll get to the good news at the end. But to get to the good news, you've got to start with, why do you need good news? What, what's the problem? So we'll look at this during worship. And then Sunday nights, not this Sunday night, but next Sunday night and following in Green City, we're going to start reading uh, Jeremiah together. And they have a great Bible study. And please come over and join us because we have great snackage, strong coffee. And we read the Bible. We just argue about it. It's wonderful. And we get confused by it. And it's just it's a good time. So I hope you can join us next Sunday as we start that Green City. But we're going to start looking at Jeremiah today. And, and to help understand what it's like to read the prophets, I, I need to take you on a detour, an unexpected detour, because we need to go to the morgue. Right? The morgue. What, what's the morgue? What, what do you do at the morgue? You take dead bodies there. And, and what's the one question you need to get answered if your body ends up at the morgue? Why did you die? Right? What happened? Because what, what they do at the morgue is they do autopsies, right? You have this, we have an understanding of what it means to be alive. Alive is breathing, uh, heart beating, brain activity, no major organ failures, all of the, we know what alive looks like. And you, you take someone to the morgue because you need to figure out what changed. What, what's the difference? What, 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 what happened to take the person from alive? What went wrong such that now they're dead? Right? That's what we try to figure out at the morgue. Sometimes it's, it's fairly obvious. So a body comes into the morgue, they take the body, and then they say, ah, there's a hole in their forehead. We don't usually live with holes in our forehead. They must be a problem. That's the difference. That's the, the, the delta. That's why you have a big delta on the front of your uh, bulletin. Delta is the physics term for difference. So what's the delta? What's the difference that caused this person to die? Oh, they, they got shot. Sometimes it's harder to figure out what the, the delta is. What's the difference? We know some, this person was alive. What happened? What changed such that they died? Um, remember hearing about, it was a couple years ago when the Nintendo Wii first came out. In California, a radio station had this competition, competition hold your Wii for a Wii. And uh, a lady drank six liters of water in three hours and then died. And they brought her to the morgue and they had to figure out what happened. And what happened was she drank so much water that she drank water and it killed her. And my understanding of it is that uh, she drank so much water that she diluted her, her blood and her, so that her elect, there weren't enough elect electrolytes in her heart to pass electrical signal down the heart to cause her heart 
to, to fire. Can you imagine being the one, you, you sit there, you have this 28-year-old healthy woman who has died, and you're sitting there in morgue and trying to figure out, well, what changed? Why did she die? That, that's, that would be a harder thing to figure out, right? But either way, that's what you try to figure out in the morgue. And, and the value of doing this is morgues are great places to train doctors. Because what do you want a doctor to be able to figure out really quickly? They, we know what living is, and a doctor you got to be able to look at it, the doctor's got to be able to look at you real quickly and say, "Is there something different here that's going to cause you to die?" So morgues are a great place to train ER doctors. In a sense, the prophets are the people who are like the doctors trained in morgues. They're the ones the, the prophets look at the nation of Israel and say, "This is how you're supposed to live, and this is the difference." This is how you're intended to live as the people of God, and this is where you're going wrong. And if you keep on going down this path, your nation is going to fall apart. It's going to die. And so to spend time with the prophets is like spending time in the morgue. It's not fun by any means. I had a highway patrolman yesterday describing the smell of a morgue. Blech. But it's important because it teaches us to be able to tell the difference between what should be and what's going wrong, so we can spot that. It, sometimes we don't need a lot of training to be able to figure that out. Uh, sometimes it's fairly obvious. A, a friend of mine was telling me about a church. It's on the East Coast, big church, $2 million budget. They voted in the same week that they had it, while they had enough money to pay $100,000 to fix their, the wooden floor in their sanctuary, they did not have $700 to help a janitor pay for an unexpected medical cost for her daughter. Right? You look at that, and yes, there's, this is how we're supposed to live as the people of God. Take care of people before things. This is what they did. I mean, that's obvious, right? I, I hope that's fairly clear. That's not, God did not smile when they took that vote. However, there are other situations where we need to be trained in, in how to discern and how to understand and how to figure out what God's opinion is, what God thinks, believes is right, because there are other situations that are far more complex. The first one that comes to mind is the 70,000 children who will come across the southern border of America this, this year. And uh, a lot of them are being deported, a lot of them are being detained. And, and is this right? Is this good? Does this make God smile how we're handling this? That's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? There's no simple, oh, that's obviously what we should do. I mean, th it, there are situations that are more challenging, and so we have to spend time in the prophets with them, helping with them so that they can help us understand this is what God thinks about that situation. So, here we go. We're going to spend some time with Jeremiah, and we're going to start out with those words at the beginning, the words that everyone skips, where it says, this is the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of King Josiah, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah of Judah until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. We all skip those words, right? The value of knowing when uh, Jeremiah spoke, when Jeremiah is speaking the word of God, is that it reminds us that a prophet is sent to a specific time and place. Jeremiah was sent to that time and that place to speak God's will. This is not some sort of vague, uh, sort of general proclamation. This is God speaking through Jeremiah to that specific time. And, and so... There are times when a prophet will look down the road and say this is what is coming, but for the most part, a biblical prophet is talking about what is happening right now. And that brings us to one of the challenges of, of reading the prophets, is that we don't live in 6th century B.C. Uh, Judah under King Josiah. We live in 21st century A.D. in America under President Obama. And, and so... It's different, right? It's obviously different. And so whatever we read, what God has to say about this time back in the 6th century, it may apply to what the situation in which we find ourselves in the 21st century. It may not apply. But to figure that out, we're going to have to pay attention to context as we go. What exactly is it that God is saying to that time? What did it mean then? And what might it mean today? And we continue to read, Now the word of the Lord came to me. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
you see, this is one of those phrases you see on like a cross stitch before before uh, let's see before I formed you in the womb I knew you and it's usually like cross stitch and it's kind of flowery and is wonderful that God knows us before we were formed and isn't that great I, I gotta confess I don't see this as being quite so flowery and wonderful a statement because of what happens next God says before I formed you in the womb I knew you and I appointed you a prophet and who wants to be a who, who wants to be a prophet who chooses to be a... Later, God is going to say, I've got your back because I'm setting you against the nations and I will rescue you. What's that mean? You're going to need rescuing, right? And so, who gets excited to know that God has chosen you since before the beginning of time so that you can be a prophet, so he can rescue you? Ugh. I don't get quite as excited about... I don't get the warm and fuzzies about this verse in quite the same way others do. But uh, then Jeremiah responds, I don't know how to speak, I'm only a boy. Prophets are never qualified for what they're called to do. Uh, Moses complained about his stuttering. The only prophet I know of who doesn't complain has no problems, or the only person who's asked to do something by God and doesn't immediately say, Ugh is Mary, right? Mary is the one who says, let it be to me as you will, which is what makes her amazing, but that's, that's a whole other sermon. The Lord we continue, and the Lord said to me, Do not say I am, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you to deliver you. Which again means you're going to need delivering, so God help you. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. I appoint you over nations to pluck up, pull down, destroy, overthrow, build, and plant. As we read Jeremiah, there are going to be strong opinions about culture, religion, faith, politics, all the things we're not supposed to talk about in polite company. And uh, we're going to read these very strong opinions. And who here has strong opinions about faith, politics, religion, culture, right? Y'all have strong po opinions about this. And obviously your opinions are right because they're yours and my opinions are, I think my opinions are right because my, they're mine. What makes these words authoritative is not that they're Jeremiah's opinions. It's not that they're strongly held opinions. What makes these opinions authoritative is because they are God's opinions. These are God's words that Jeremiah is speaking. And so Jeremiah is going to speak these words, and they're going to stir up some trouble. If you read the verbs there, pluck up, pull down, destroy, overthrow, and then build and plant... He's going to get to the constructive things and building things later. But first, there's got to be some pulling down, destroying, and overthrowing. That's, that's Jeremiah's call, is to go out and do this. And then we have the very first vision Jeremiah has. I often wonder, how does prophecy work? How do the prophets know what God is saying? I, I don't make any claim to understand it all, but what we see here is one of, one of the ways it works, where uh, Jeremiah is walking along and he sees this almond tree. And, uh, much like, and something about it catches his eye, and I'm sure it's the same way that something about a, a, a bush catches Moses' eye, right? And so something about this almond tree catches his eye, and he hears this word from God, uh, what do you see? And he says, I see an almond tree, a shook head in Hebrew. And God says, yep, that's right, I am watching, shook head. God uses puns. That it's a divine joke. It's, it's divine humor, as, or as close as we get to it here. Something about this almond tree calls God to mind, and, and he focuses on God, and he, because he is watching, he sees this connection between the shuck head of the almond tree and the shuck head that God is watching, right, what is going on right now. And the same type of thing happens in, uh, next. We, we read that... Uh, what, when the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, a bo boiling pot tilted away from the north. And the Lord said to me, out oh, of the north, disaster shall break out on all the inhabitants. Now to say that disaster is coming from the north, that's not the surprise here, right? If you think of your geography, think of Israel, they're not going to get invaded from the west, Mediterranean Sea. No one's coming from the east, the desert. South, not happening because, well, Egypt's not a problem right then. So if there's going to be an invasion, it's coming from the north. That's where Assyria will invade from, Babylon, Persia, uh, the Roman Empire down the road. If there is a problem in Israel, someone's coming down from the north to cause problems. So it, it's, to say that some, uh, there's an invasion coming from the north is about as obvious as saying we have a storm coming from the west. Duh. 
I mean, that, that's just how it works. The surprise here is not that God says it's coming from the north. The surprise here is that God says it's about to happen. Oh, and by the way, it's coming from the north. And why it's happening, we read, I, God, will utter my judgments against them, for they made offerings to other gods for all of their wickedness in forsaking me. But you yourself gird up your loins, stand up and tell them everything I command you. The reason that this is about to happen to the nation is because the nation has committed this great wickedness. And so now Jeremiah is going to stand and point this out and God will protect them because no one loves someone like the guy who stands up and says, Oh, y'all are sinners. Isn't that your favorite person to hang out with? Y'all are sinners. Yeah, that, that's the one. He's going to need some, some protection. <laughs> so... They're straying from what uh, Moses has taught them. They're straying from the, the way that they're supposed to treat everyone as one of God's children. And Jeremiah is out there to tell them this. And you might wonder, if Jeremiah shows up and says, I have a word from the Lord, and they say, yep, this is a prophet, why didn't they all just change? Right? Why did it go bad? Why didn't they all go, oh, you're right, Jeremiah. This is God's opinion. We should change that. Right? If you think about the type of thing that a prophet critiques, they tend to be the bigger cultural aspects. The, the things that are the, the, the way that you've been doing things and your dad did things and his dad did things. And to change them is to imagine an entirely different way of living that can be rather challenging to conceive of. To take a sort of like amoral, not ethically wrought example, Think of how hard it'd be if right now we all decided we were going to have electric cars. Right? It, it, I think it's a fairly safe thing to say at some point we're going to run out of gas, and at some point we're going to need to go to solar and wind power at some point. But if we wanted to do it right now and make a big systemic culture-wide change, how hard would it be to do that? All the gas stations would have to get shifted over. We would have to get, start making a lot more batteries. Entire, I mean, Ford. God help Ford. It would all just have to go, it would have to go from making one type of engine to an entirely different type. Think of how much disruption it would take just to make a change like that. Which, in the general scheme of things, is, is kind of comparatively small. Just to have everyone drive an electric car. Now, that that's kind of even a small change when it comes to what the prophets are talking about. Because what the prophets are talking about are systemic sin. It's when the prophets get to going, Jeremiah is speaking the word of God, he's not talking about things like, y'all should really drive electric cars, it's good for the environment. He's saying things like, well, America has a problem with racism, right? We, we have a problem with... Uh, we, Slavery, and then we have the civil right, then the civil war. Slaves were freed. Then we have the civil rights movement. And to this day, there is still a problem. And why is it? There are more black people in jail right now than were enslaved back in the 18th century, right? And why is that the case? To understand these type of things, you have, you got to get down into the weeds of things like drug law. People. Black people tend to live in the city, which is where, if you're going to use an illegal drug, it tends to be crack cocaine as opposed to powdered cocaine. Powdered cocaine is the white collar drug. Crack cocaine is a sort of lower class blue collar drug. And if you use crack cocaine, you get a much higher sentence than if you use just straight powdered cocaine. And so we have racism baked into our sentencing laws when it comes to uh, drug usage. And, and so if we were going to change how, uh, our, if we were going to address sort of the systemic racism that's built into our legal code, we would have to change our sentencing laws and we'd have to back off, on, on, we'd either have to get tougher on cocaine or get less tough on crack. And when's the last time you've heard someone argue for that? And what do you think the likelihood of that's going to happen in our current legislative situation, right? So. When the prophets start speaking about problems that are culture-wide, they tend to be problems like that, sort of entrenched racism that shows up in drug policy. These are not the type of challenges that you can just say, oh, let's just fix that tomorrow. That's what a prophet points out. And so it kind of makes sense that we don't tend to talk about the first part of the prophets because, well, they're kind of depressing. They really are rather depressing. 
we are not trying in reading the prophet to recreate 6th century BC Israel. We do live in 21st century America, but what we do read can help us understand how to respond, how to, how to name the difference. This is what God's will is, and this is how we're living, and what's the difference there? What, what, how can we understand what God does desire? Part of living as disciples of Jesus is to be able first to, to name what that difference is. This is the kingdom of God. This is where we're going. This is where we're at. And there's a difference there. And we, we need to work towards uh, being, being embodying the kingdom of God, being able to, to dare to name those differences and to work towards addressing them. And, and the only way that we can dare to address these things is because we have the sure and certain faith that Jesus was resurrected, right? If, if we, are go, if we in, engage in the big problems of society, if we start talking about them, if we sort of tear the cover off and start looking at the biggest challenges that we as a culture or a church as a nation face, it'd be really easy to get depressed if we did not hold on to the sure and stubborn hope that Jesus got over being dead, right? This is what I have to remind myself on, especially when I'm reading something like Jeremiah. Jesus got over being dead. And there is no greater problem than death. And so we can look at these problems not because we're foolishly uh, just thinking, let's just solve them because we can somehow figure them out. We can look at them because we believe that if Jesus conquered death, there's no other problem that's greater. And by his power, we can address any other problem we face. Amen.